Hello and welcome to this second Bartfield's Forensic Accountants webinar on confiscation in lockdown. You might remember that in the first session we dealt with the period from the date of conviction to the date the confiscation order is made. Now in this second webinar we're moving on from there and we're looking at settling a confiscation order in lockdown. So we'll be looking at the period from the date the confiscation order is made to the time when it has been paid off. So here's our agenda. We'll start with time to pay, and then look at extending the time to pay, move on to the consequences of failing to pay on time, and then applying to reduce the amount to pay, what we often refer to as a section 23 application. And then I'll say a little bit about how Bartfield's forensic accountants can help. Right, let's kick off. Time to pay. Perhaps surprisingly, under the legislation, the initial position is that the confiscation order is payable in full immediately that it's made. So payable in full on the day it's made. That's the starting point under the legislation. But of course, in practice, that generally is not going to be possible. So there is provision for allowing some time to pay. And here we need to look at section 11 of the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. Now let's remember that this webinar is dealing with the Proceeds of Crime Act as it applies in England and Wales under part two of the Proceeds of Crime Act. So section 11 is the section that applies in England and Wales and that allows the court to specify different due dates for different sums within the total amount that the defendant has been ordered to pay. And to allow payment to be due at a date not more than three months after the date of the order. That's the initial period of extension. Now, to help in this webinar, I'm going to use an example of a gentleman called Benedict. I'm afraid you're going to hear rather a lot about Benedict in the next few minutes. So let's look at Benedict's example. Benedict has been made subject to a confiscation order on the 8th of January, and he is required to pay 100,000 pounds in total under that order. The background to that is that Benedict actually has 20,000 pounds in a bank account, and he also owns his home. The house in which he lives has been valued for confiscation purposes. The market value is said to be 300,000 pounds. And he's got an outstanding mortgage of 220,000 pounds against that. So there is 80,000 pounds of equity in the house. So the judge on the 8th of January, against that background, orders Benedict to pay the first 20,000 pounds within 28 days. That's just to allow a little, a little bit of time for him to sort out the bank account and get the money into court. The balance needs to come from the sale of his house, and that's going to take a little while longer. So the judge decides to give him the maximum allowable time to pay at this stage, which is three months. So the £80,000 is going to be due on the 8th of April. So far, so good. What about extending the time to pay? Under subsection 4 of section 11, the court can allow payment to be further deferred so as to be due at a date not more than six months after the date of the order. So let's go back to Benedict. Assume that he can't sell his home and get the sales proceeds in in time to pay on the 8th of April. And so before the 8th of April, he makes an application for a further period 
to be allowed. The court agrees and extends the payment period for the £80,000 to the 8th of July, which is now six months after the date on which the confiscation order was made. Section 11 provides that the application for an extension, and this can be a little confusing, the application for the extension has to be made before the due date. So in this case, we're applying for an extension for a payment that was due on the 8th of April. That application has to be made before the 8th of April. If the application is made before the 8th of April, the court can hear it and grant the application any time up to the 8th of July. And when it grants the application, assuming it does grant the application, it can allow an extended period also up to the 8th of July. But if it doesn't hear the application by the 8th of July, then it cannot hear it because the time is gone. So the application has to be heard within six months of the day on which the confiscation order was made. And the maximum period that can be allowed is up to six months after the date the confiscation order was made. Who makes the application? Well, the application, unsurprisingly, is made by the defendant or his legal representatives. But note that under section 11, there is no facility for an extension beyond six months. So, in other words, we can't go back for a further extension beyond, in Benedict's case, the 8th of July. What are the consequences if Benedict does not pay by the 8th of July? Well, the first thing is that interest will start to accrue on the amount outstanding. And that interest is calculated under section 12. It's at the rate that it applies to civil judgments, which is currently 8% per annum, and indeed has been 8% per annum for a very long time. And so if we take the example of Benedict, he has failed to pay 80,000 pounds that was due by the 8th of July. 8% interest on £80,000 amounts to £17.53 per day. So £17.53 approximately per day will be added to the amount which Benedict is required to pay. What other consequences are there of failure to pay on time? Well, steps may be commenced to activate the default sentence which was specified in the confiscation order. We haven't really discussed default sentences, but as you will know, when the confiscation order is made, the judge will also specify a default sentence to be triggered in the event of non-payment. Again, let's look at Benedict. Benedict has failed to pay 80% of the amount required to be paid. You remember he was ordered to pay £100,000. He's paid £20,000. He has not paid, at this stage, £80,000, which is 80% of the amount. So because he has failed to pay 80% of the amount required to be paid under the order, he is at risk of a default sentence of 80% of the default sentence which was specified when the order was made. It applies pro rata to the proportion that he hasn't paid. What can Benedict do? Well, he's still not sold his house. Let's suppose that Benedict is going to sell his house for a lower figure. How does that work in terms of the confiscation? An application can be made to reduce the amount required to be paid under the order. 
That application is made under section 23. And what section 23 says is that before the confiscation order has been fully satisfied, an application may be made to the Crown Court to vary the amount required to be paid so that it is reduced. Note that under section 23, the court cannot increase the amount required to be paid. It can either leave it alone or reduce it. The application to reduce the amount required to be paid can be made, understandably, by the defendant or his representatives. But perhaps a little more surprisingly, the application could also be made by the prosecutor or by a receiver appointed under the Act to realise Benedict's assets, or realise, I should say, the defendant's assets for the purposes of confiscation. Now you might say, why? Why would the prosecutor want to reduce the amount that's required to be paid? Well, the reason is this. Suppose you have a situation in which all the defendant's assets have been realised, all the money from them has been paid into court, there is nothing more, there is nowhere else to go, the cupboard is bare, but there is still an amount outstanding on the confiscation order. The prosecutor or, or receiver might simply want to tidy things up and say, we're not going to receive that money. It's pointless having that order sitting there with an amount apparently outstanding. Let's go back to the Crown Court and ask them to reduce the amount required to be paid so that the amount outstanding has become nil and the matter's satisfied. So what happens is that an application is made to the Crown Court under Section 23 and the court is then, under Section 23, the court is required to undertake a fresh calculation of the defendant's available amount and we're looking now at the defendant's available amount at the date of the new court hearing. We're not undertaking a fresh calculation of the defendant's available amount on the day the order was made, back in January in Benedict's case. We're making a fresh calculation of the defendant's available amount today, his current situation. The court will also inquire into the realisation of any assets that were originally part of his available amount when the order was made and which he, the defendant, he or she, no longer has. And the point is, those assets must not have been overlooked. We can't quietly forget about a few thousand pounds in a bank account somewhere and keep it to one side on a Section 23 application. We have to look at all the assets that were identified at the time the order was made, as well as any new assets if we become aware of them. And then we do this fresh calculation of the defendant's available amount. If the defendant's current available amount under that calculation is insufficient to satisfy the amount which remains outstanding, remaining to be paid under the confiscation order, then the court has discretion to vary the confiscation order to reduce the total amount required to be paid under it. In practice, if the application is successful, the court is going to use that discretion to vary the confiscation order to reduce the total amount required to be paid under the order so that the amount which remains outstanding is equal to the defendant's current available amount. And one consequence of that is that the interest which has been accruing, which we mentioned earlier, disappears. 
it effectively evaporates. So to understand this better, let's have a look at Benedict. You remember Benedict had paid only 20,000 pounds off a 100,000 pound confiscation order. So the outstanding amount is 80,000 pounds. And that, if you remember, was the equity said to be in Benedict's house. That was based on a property valuation of 300,000 pounds and an outstanding mortgage of 220,000 pounds. And in accordance with section nine, that property valuation will be an open market price based on a willing buyer and a willing seller. Of course, the reality is that Benedict really needs to get a quick sale. And today, the reality is that because of the pandemic, he may have serious difficulty in selling his house and realizing the money in any reasonable period of time. So let's assume Benedict was unable to sell the house before the 8th of July. And that, if you remember, was the date six months after the confiscation order was made, the date when Benedict was required to pay the balance. He's now been able to sell his house. That's the good news, but not at a price of 300,000 pounds. And in fact, after the solicitor's fees have been paid, the estate agent's fees have been paid, the mortgage has been settled. There is not 80,000 pounds of equity left in Benedict's hands, but there is 30,000 pounds of net sales proceeds. Let's say that Benedict has now that 30,000 pounds in the bank, having sold his house. So Benedict now makes an application to court under section 23. Let's say the court hears the application on the 27th of October. Looking at Benedict's situation, the court determines that Benedict's current available amount is the 30,000 pounds, which he's now got in the bank having sold his house. The court finds, naturally, that 30,000 pounds isn't sufficient to satisfy the remaining amount outstanding under the order, as it was made in January. And that is 80,000 pounds, plus, of course, now some interest, because Benedict didn't pay on time. So the court uses its discretion under section 23 to reduce the amount required to be paid under the order to 50,000 pounds. Where does that leave Benedict? Benedict paid 20,000 pounds on the 5th of February. And so there remains 30,000 pounds now outstanding of that 50,000 pounds due under the order as it has been varied. The accrued interest is gone. And Benedict promptly uses the net sales proceeds to pay the remaining 30,000 pounds. So now the confiscation order as varied has been satisfied. That's how section 23 operates. What does that mean for the future? Will it be possible for there to be further variations of the order? Well, the short answer is yes. The variation of a confiscation order under section 23 does not prevent the court from subsequently varying the order again. How might that happen? Well, let's suppose that the history went slightly differently, that Benedict agreed a sale of his home for 250,000 pounds and expected to have 30,000 pounds net sales proceeds to pay off the order. 
and at that stage, let's suppose that Benedict goes back to goes to court, makes his Section 23 application. The court accepts that he is only going to have £30,000 and makes the variation so that the amount ordered to be paid on that confiscation order is now £50,000. But let's suppose something goes a bit wrong in the final stages of selling the property and Benedict has to knock another £5,000 off the price. So that when things turn out, he's got not £30,000, but £25,000. Well, he can go back to court and make a further Section 23 application and seek a further variation under Section 23. And that's what he would do in that circumstance. So what I'm saying is just because there has been a variation under Section 23 does not prevent there being another variation under Section 23 if that's appropriate. The only time that we, as it were, run out of road with section 23 is when the order has actually been satisfied. And of course, you're not going to make an application under section 23 when you've satisfied the order because there's no need. So that's section 23 variations sorted out. But as I'm sure you know, there are other sections in POCA which can lead to a variation of a confiscation order. And a variation having been made under section 23 does not prevent those other sections being brought into use for later variations of the order. So under section 21, for example, if the uh, prosecution find reason for uh, additional benefit to be identified based on information that they didn't have at the time the confiscation order was made, the prosecution under section 21 can go back to court and ask the court to amend the benefit for them. There's a time limit on that, it has to be done within six years. But more frequently and perhaps causing more difficulty to defendants. The prosecution could also go back to court under section 22. And under section 22, this is the section where the prosecution find additional available amount after the order has been satisfied, or indeed before the order has been satisfied, but additional available amount. So that you might have a defendant who has um, worked hard and produced legitimate wealth some years down the line, who may be subject to a section 22 revisit. And that's a topic we're going to be looking at in a fortnight's time in our next webinar. That is section 22 revisits and variations of confiscations, confiscation orders. So, how do Bartfield's forensic accountants help? Well, Bartfield's are fully staffed. We're undertaking legally aided and privately funded criminal and civic and civil forensic accountancy work. And I'm happy to say that it's relatively easy for us to conduct the bulk of our work remotely using our up-to-date and secure IT facilities. We remain readily contactable by phone by email and online video. And our recently updated uh, website is full of useful information, including uh, an article on this topic. And indeed, you can find it on the website, www.bartfieldsforensic.co.uk slash insights slash news. I'm going to arrange for a free recording of this webinar to be emailed to you. And now we've got a couple of minutes to deal with questions. And I have a question here, um, which is based on perhaps, uh, a, perhaps a slight misunderstanding of the way that the confiscation legislation works. 
we all know that when a confiscation order is made, it's made so that the amount required to be paid is whichever is the lower of the defendant's benefit and his available amount. And what I've just said about Benedict is that in October, his available amount was £30,000, but the amount required to be paid under the confiscation order was £50,000. So the question is, have I not here broken one of the cardinal rules of confiscation by saying that the amount required to be paid is greater than the available amount? Well, the answer to that is no, I haven't broken that rule. Uh, and the reason is to do with the rule. Um, the rule comes from section seven. And um, section seven sets out that the recoverable amount for the purposes of making a confiscation order under section six, the recoverable, recoverable amount for section six purposes is the lower of the benefit and the defendant's available amount with, as we know, the burden on the defendant to satisfy the court regarding his available amount being lower than his benefit. But that relates to the making of an order under section six. It doesn't relate to the varying of an order under section 23 or indeed under section 22. So to say that Benedict's available amount in October is 30,000 pounds, but the amount payable under the order in total is 50,000 pounds, doesn't cut across section seven because section seven doesn't apply in those circumstances. Okay, I hope that clarifies that. Our email addresses, phone numbers are on the slide there. Thank you very much for your time. And I will see you in a fortnight. Thank you.